Cool. All right. So, um, Sam, if you could go ahead and introduce yourself and then hands on Brian. Sure. Uh, can we go a little bio or just. Yeah, sure. Oh, awesome. So, I'm, hi, I'm Sam Thompson. I'm the managing senior producer, or one of them, at uh, Sony Entertainment, Interactive Entertainment for White Studios. Uh, I work with Naughty Dog. I worked with Naughty Dog since Crash 2, basically. It, it worked, uh, I had the pleasure of working on a number of uh, franchises along the way with Sony First Party. Um, today, though, I'm a daily, day-to-day uh, -day producer for all Naughty Dog IP. Uh, so anything that Naughty Dog is working on, anything that's going on with those IPs, uh, goes uh, across my desk at some point. I'm Anton Springer. I'm a lead designer at Firaxis Games, most recently on Civilization VI Rise and Fall. And I've been working on the Civilization franchise since 2011. Um, and it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. You guys didn't get the uh, shirt memo, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> um, we can be bookends here. Uh, I'm Brian Allgaier. Uh, I've been an artist, animator since the early 90s, um, working on CD, um, CDI, Philips Interactive Media, and then became a designer on the Ratchet and Clank series. And also was a creative director in the Ratchet and Clank series, and now the director of experience at Insomniac on Spider Man for the PlayStation 4. So, first question I got you guys is, what's your exposure with games in the Respit, personally? Like, you know, what, how has it been involved with your projects? What have you guys done for it? Uh, sure, um, so uh, I was involved, I think that my first exposure to um, user research was on Spyro the, uh, the Dragon. I was a designer and they asked me to watch a bunch of videos. And I was in you know, like a box of like 100 videos or whatever. I was actually probably 20 VHS tapes. And I didn't like watch through all of them, take notes. That was rather painful, so it wasn't a very good initial uh, impression. But then over the years, uh, it's been extremely helpful. And um, recently, on one of our VR projects on Edge of Nowhere, um, it really helped us in terms of getting people comfortable with VR. Um, that was a big challenge, and so I saw some huge benefits to that. So, as a designer, it's definitely been a kind of up and down um, process, but um, it's absolutely um, necessary. <laughs> Yeah, there's been ups and downs for me as well. Uh, my favorite is when we do uh, user tests on site um, in Baltimore where Firaxis is based, and we can go and kind of the developers can observe behind a one-way mirror and kind of take our own notes and have our own discussions and stuff and learn from that. But, you know, sometimes we get reports after the fact as well, watch videos after the fact. Um, it's all been helpful. You know, there are some ups and downs like what processes kind of work best with our development schedule. But, um, yeah, kind of for a couple of years now, I've been seeing different reports. Uh, well, I started... Uh, Right when I hit PD, we were working on Jack and Daxter, and I started working with Mark Cerny very early on, and I focused testing, and I know Brian, you remember those days quite well. Uh, and so I learned a lot of what I know about modern game development through Mark Cerny's Cerny method and kind of watching him work. I think that was a tremendous learning experience for me. And I think from that point forward, we adopted a lot of those philosophies at Naughty Dog, and we really didn't work with research until quite recently. Uh, we had kind of a brief stint with one researcher, didn't work out quite so well. We shipped another product, the Last of Us, uh, on our own, and then uh, we uh, brought in Kevin Keeker for Uncharted 4, and uh, that man's a unicorn, and uh, he's going to change the way uh, we work, but it, it was great. But up until that point, we were kind of flying blind. So one, uh, one question I want to follow up on that is, what was kind of your initial thought? So the very first time you guys were working on user research, what, what was kind of your sentiment, your feeling about it? Anxiety, fear, yeah. uh, trepidation. Um, so the, the, one, the, the biggest fear I had was I didn't want somebody to come in and disrupt our development pipeline. I don't want somebody to come in with uh, these kind of high-level goals uh, that in, aren't really integrated with the team, that they're not speaking to people, they're not uh, communicating outward. And so there's, there's, there's a whole different kind of culture from the development side. There's a, a, a language that you have to understand. You have to look at the schedule. You have to understand what our, our goals are, what our systemic goals are. Uh, when things are coming online, and you have to work with our development process. And so my biggest fear was that they would come in and disrupt that and cause chaos. We've seen it happen before. Um, you, you have to have a we mentality. It's always the best idea rises to the top. It's not your idea, but the best idea. It's always got to be we before I. And I think that's a hard lesson for a lot of folks to learn. And certainly my biggest fear was seeing that. Um, we have had some experiences with that, but luckily again with uh, Kevin, that's not the case at all. Yeah, for me, definitely, uh, as a designer and developer, it was, it was hard to, like, kind of keep my hands still being behind that one-way mirror sometimes, because, yeah, like, you know, the uh, players were saying, like, hey, I don't, I don't understand this, I'm not having fun, we'd have wrap-up questions at the end, like, some things just went totally over their heads, so, like, it was extremely valuable, but kind of had kind of a tough skin as a developer, and luckily we have for access, you know, with our iterative process, that is sort of par for the course 
Um, but yeah, like um, it is very a very useful process. Um, at times frustrating, but I think um, I, we've had a lot of value and a lot of success. Not just having the user researcher kind of give their more objective take, but having developers behind the glass um, to kind of have these side conversations while players are playing a game like Civilization, which takes a while to get a feel for. I think it uh, definitely took me time to warm up to user research. Um, I liked it because a lot of times it served as a great uh, hard line uh, deadline for us. So we had to get all of our stuff together because we knew that real people were going to play it. Um, but as a designer, like a lot of times we go into these tests and I would know that all these, we have all these problems are not giving proper feedback on when the player's low on health. And for me, like I was always had this anxiety that this is going to be a big waste of time. Like here I'm going to sit here and they're going to tell me that the player can't tell that they're, they're low on health. I'm going to have a report on it and I'm going to go over it with all the producers and we go over with my team. And it's, and, but at the same time, there's a lot of incredibly valuable information that comes with, a, with that. And um, we had Bill Fulton, uh, who's a legend, uh, used to work with us on the Resistance series and, and the Ratchet Clank series. And it was really great when he could talk to us from his point of view about what the player was experiencing and speak in kind of layman's term, because I didn't know what uh, cognitive, I don't know, I, I didn't know what the cell theory was or you know, the schemas, any of that stuff was. but. He could speak in plain uh, English uh, to, to a guy like me. <laughs> so, you know, working directly either on the development team or kind of with the development team, uh, what sort of helper approach do you feel has been you know, most effective in helping with the studios work? Yeah, so for Firaxis, I would say um, having like an in-depth, in-context sort of debrief. Like if there's just a report, if there's just a slide deck, um, yeah, I can sort of glean uh, the, uh, some big takeaways from it, but I might have follow-up questions. I might not understand exactly like the points that are taken from. I might want to dig into some more data that um, that we have, but wasn't part of the deck because you know uh, the user researcher didn't think it was important, but it's sort of like curious to me because I see how it links to something else. So I think having a, a conversation, um, you know, face to face might not be possible, but that'd be ideal. Um, or a debrief sort of phone call where you're, you know, like have half an hour, half an hour sort of dedicated to going over this feedback for a particular session. I think I've found that the most helpful over the years. Yeah. I think I've passed the too. <laughs> I, to, to add to that, one thing that I found super beneficial was we did a test on um, one of the early Ratchet games, and we had the folks from Sony uh, come over to our office, and we streamed it for the entire team. So that was a very great way of being inclusive and bringing the team into the fold, and they could actually see how the whole test was run. It wasn't like this weird black box or dark science that was, was hidden from them. Uh, and then we could have people like throw in notes on IM or email, and that was just a great inclusive uh, process. I think uh, well, for us, uh, when we work with Naughty Dog, Naughty Dog has uh, an internal testing facility uh, in the studio. So we have 25 stations. We have a really complex, <coughs> sorry, really complex analytics system uh, that's plugged into all of our charter development tools. Uh, and then we have uh, live streaming across the whole studio. So for us, our actual viewing room with our uh, you know, uh, one-way glass is actually kind of antiquated. If it wasn't for the load-bearing walls, I would have ripped it out two years ago. Um, because we don't operate like that anymore. And I think the way the studio works is um, we're very agile. We have a number of engaged uh, employees across all disciplines. And we have, so let's say we run a three-day test. Um, we have wrap-ups at the end of each day. Uh, we don't have time for reports. We don't have time uh, to, you know, go back and create a lot of uh, great fuzzy graphics and, and, and uh, interesting diagrams. Because the team is so engaged in watching these streams, they're automatically actioning items on their own agenda uh, within hours of the playtest. So it's it's up to us to get information out quickly and effectively. And so we have, like, we may wrap the test up at 10 o'clock in the evening, and then we have about a three-hour window where we're maybe at the studio until one or two in the morning uh, discussing kind of all of our findings. We have live researchers watching at multiple locations giving us real-time feedback uh, from our streams. We kind of have this triage session, session where we have to work very quickly to organize this data. And I think the key to this is we get in there early, we meet with all the design leads early and see what their agendas are, what they're looking for in all the levels, so we have an idea of what we can ask, what we need to look for, cater our internal uh, surveys to all this. So if you have a mindset of what you know you're looking for going in, it's easy to kind of manage this quick turnaround. So let's talk about the opposite, right? So like, you know, in your experience, what do you think has been the least effective, right? Or like, you know, just what do you recommend you kind of avoid? I think, uh, well, Brian and I, uh, we were talking about this earlier, but I think the biggest thing is um, understanding kind of what the team is looking for and 
being able to work directly with what they, they need to be effective. And uh, you know, like uh, big reports for us are, are kind of heady and nobody has time to sit and read through a huge analysis of you know why people are saving and why they aren't. Um, you know, we use annotation systems to quickly kind of communicate and we can link two or three live code examples right there and prove the point, move on, and we don't have to kind of beat it to death. I think um, the team has got so much on their plate and we have such a broad scope of development that uh, we just don't have time to stick our teeth into anything that's, uh, you know, takes more than, you know, 15 minutes to go over and discuss. So for us, uh, the things that don't work are huge meetings before the focus test, uh, desk side chats take over an hour, uh, lofty goals, um, if you're not looking at, you know, thing, looking at things based in reality, right? Like, um, you know, if you have these ideas and, uh, and things that haven't really been proved yet, probably save those for, you know, like gray box testing early on with pre-prototyping because anything after alpha, nobody wants to hear about that stuff. Like, we need practical solutions that we can implement quickly. Um, I mean, obviously we're open to interpretation, but it's just uh, time is the essence. And at that point, the team is working 12 to 16 hours a day patients run short, so if you just have to make the most of the time you have with individuals. Yeah, I'd say, um, yeah, I, I, I would kind of echo that. Like, big, heady reports are kind of hard to get through. Um, I'm not a fan of what I call the fire and forget report. Like, someone just kind of like, okay, yeah, here's the test, here's the conclusions I came to, and like, there it is, no follow-up, no context. Luckily, that doesn't happen very often, in my experience. Um, I've been very fortunate, but um, yeah, I would say definitely follow up with the developers themselves. And I'd say like the more degrees of separation you get away from people who are actually at the play test, I think it becomes less effective. Like um, kind of sounds like a similar process to you. Like we try to be very inclusive for the developers. Like whoever wants to come to the play test, yeah, come on in. We got a big room, we'll watch, we'll talk about things while they're playing, while there's downtime, we'll make changes like that night, the next day. Sometimes we'll even bring our laptops and like change the code while, while we're just, okay, well I'll fix that now. Yeah. <laughs> so so that, that sort of stuff, like people who feel involved in the process on the development side, I think is very important. And like it, on the flip side, if you're just kind of getting this report, you know, like, oh, hey, like we did this user test black box thing, and like on the other end of it, like we decided that this needs to change, like that's, I think, less helpful and it's going to be less motivating for the team. Uh, yeah, one thing that um, we try to avoid is um, anything that gets in the way of people getting to the information as quickly as possible. So. I try to avoid just like saying, hey, watch this video at this you know, at this um, timeline here, and instead try to, we have this uh, tool that creates a link that goes directly to that spot in the video so they can see the actual clip. Um, I try to turn reports around very quickly within like an hour or two of the test, just really top line stuff. I try to mix some good with the bad as well, because I find that if I do too much negative, people stop coming to me to do tests. <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of kind of you know internal stuff going on that, that you have to be uh, careful about. Um, but yeah, I think ultimately it's just being able to turn things around quickly if you can. And if there's bigger, meteor reports, then those can take longer, but those should be rare. So follow up to that. So you guys all mentioned like you know, kind of these big reports are just too much. What's, what's kind of the max length you guys would recommend? Like when we're talking like a big report, what's a small or, or concise report look like? Uh, well, I try to keep mine to just a couple of pages and I usually paste it into the email. So I'll just send a quick high level um, summary and then right below that they can just scroll straight down and look at it. And then they can click on video links and take them right to the video clip. And so I try to make that as, as easy as possible. Yeah, so to pin down a number, I'd say if I'm reading it again out of context without a deeper phone call or something, I'd say like five pages is probably like a good number. I'd, I'd agree with that. Um, on the other hand, you know, like um, one of our user testers, like our user researchers, like there was like a 30 or 40 slide, uh, you know, PowerPoint presentation was pretty meaty, but because we did a deeper phone call and I was able to ask about it in context, like it was, it was all great stuff and I was able to like get through it very well. Uh, I think for us, I, I agree with Brian, I think one or two pages. The, the way we generally structure things is we'll have uh, a top line, like 10 or 15, like top little items that we carry over from test to test and stack rate based on, you know, how far we've come to solve the issue. Then we have a number of, of subset issues, and that's the initial kind of report. And then we have our QA team follow up with a data driven report the, the very next morning that has probably, you know, up to 10 pages of reference. But the interesting thing about what we can do on the Naughty Dog side is uh, we can actually, all of our, our telemetry system and our capture system are all integrated. So if we reference a video link, we can actually re-render that space and code in real time and put all of these instances together and kind of play them and look at them. So for us, it's about just running those data samples together and the team can quickly go and select it. I think the other thing that we do pretty well is uh, 
we, we group everything by discipline. So uh, you have obviously the game director, creative director, that's going to look at the top level stuff, and then we can go through discipline and kind of group everything that way so that if you're a level lead, if you're an artist, you go specifically to your level of what you're looking at so you can quickly reference information you need to access. And I know we kind of talk about this next question a lot, but um, just curious if there's any method aside from, you know, debrief, obviously, top line reports, those are kind of the impactful ones. Is there anything else that really stands out as like especially useful for you guys as far as like how we could be, you know, packaging or delivering our, our findings over to you guys? Well, for us, I think again, it's um, the studio is quite flat. There, there is uh, encouragement to uh, engage with other employees to uh, you know communicate directly. Uh, we have an internal chat tool that we utilize. Um, you know, it's Slack Lite, but we have Naughty Dog wrote it internally, so it's it's our own kind of uh, program. I, I can encourage you enough to develop relationships with your development partners to understand the roles of the organization, all the different roles within each team. Everybody has a unique perspective, and if you can go and communicate with them one-on-one, -on -one, and I know it takes a little bit more time, but if you can do that, the relationship you build, the insight, the insight that you're able to, to gain from that is absolutely invaluable. You have to be able to have those relationships, and I think, to your point, the more you have these reports that are kind of faceless and heady, and they, they uh, emails and written word can be kind of really bland, and it can, it can, it's hard to see the emotion of the intent behind the words. And sometimes it can read like a set of demands and marching orders. And if I've had three hours of sleep in four days and I read something like that, I'm bound to like throw something through a window. So I don't want that. But if you come over to me and say, hey, this is what we're seeing, it's kind of crazy, why don't you take a look? What are your thoughts? That's a totally different level of engagement. So I think that's what works the best for us. Yeah, I think that having that relationship, again, is, is really important. And knowing the studio and knowing the game. Like, you know, at Fraxis, we don't have creative directors or design directors. We have a lead designer who also is a part time programmer, because that's the Sid Meier model, right? So, like, we make very different games and, like, you know, with different priorities, different demands. That's why we can do the laptop thing during the test to fix the problem and stuff. Um, but yeah, I would say get to know your team, get to know your developers. And um, I, something that I appreciate is like uh, some more qualitative analysis too. Like yes, okay, like here are the takeaways, here are the parts from another game where people are getting stuck. But like when the user researcher knows enough about our game and our own priorities and the sort of design that we're going for, um, you know, he or she can make a top three, you know, like, hey, like, here are the, like, the real sticking points that I found that, like, people are really getting stuck on. And here are the sort of, like, more big picture quality stuff that I find. And I can take that or leave that because I have the bigger picture of the, the whole development process. But I found that that's pretty helpful. And, you know, if we can address those top three line items that people are getting stuck on, then the next user test around, you know, will have a, a fresher set of three to improve the game even further. That's a good point. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, at Insomniac, uh, we typically do smaller individual tests, so um, we don't have a very large facility there. So I'll sit down with the person, or four people typically, have them play through, and then write a, that quick short report they sent out in an email, which is helpful. But then we have a big test of our publisher, which is uh, currently Sony. That's where we have a 20-person team. That's where we get the bigger, longer reports. And we have uh, folks like Clay Warlick, who's in the audience, hi Clay. Uh, who uh, gives us a nice uh, 30 to, to hour long briefing and walks us through a much longer uh, PowerPoint. And so those happen roughly every uh, eight weeks. So depending on, I guess, the, um, the size of the test, I, I guess the report would reflect that. Uh, the other thing that I think is really important is throughout the um, production, depending on the feedback, like Sam had said earlier, if we're an alpha, if we're an alpha and we're getting feedback that you know, change everything or there's like this huge problem that we don't even have any idea on how to fix that is extremely frustrating. So I think you have to kind of think about where it is along in the project and what kind of feedback to give. Because towards the end, there aren't going to be any big changes. It is what it is. And we just have to kind of lock things down and, and ship it. Cool. So talking about that, so having those direct conversations, right? Like, who do you feel is the most effective person for researchers to reach out to? Like, at what level? Like, is there a you know, main point of contact? Who should, who should we be talking to? Well, certainly um, all of the leads. So the, typically it's the lead designer to start with. Um, and oftentimes uh, user research and design have so much overlap. But we are finding that a lot of the artists are curious about how they can better light levels to direct the player. And they would love to get that feedback too. So as many of the leads as possible. I highly recommend visiting the studio as much as you can, um, getting to know um, people even if it's just like for, for a really quick uh, meeting, but that goes a long way in, in smoothing out the, uh, the road bumps. 
Yeah, I'd say um, I, I find that producers are really good people for this sort of thing because, um, to your point, like you know, finding the right window where you can test a build that has enough to get good feedback on, but isn't too late where we can't change a lot. Like the pr the producer is going to have like at least at for access the, the best pulse on that sort of thing. Um, but um, you know, beyond that, I would say the leads of you know are are very used to include um, and you know, lead designer, lead UI person, lead UX person, however your studio kind of does that. Um, I think are probably the people you definitely want to include. Um, at for access, we're, we're kind of flat as well, and our teams are small enough that I almost feel like, in, in, at least with our process, like whoever wants to come, really. <laughs> like, if you have an interest in it, and, and like to my earlier point, like if you're there, you kind of see, you understand, you get that perspective. So, like if you can, like I would recommend being as inclusive as you could. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think for, for us, um, Early on in my career, I was kind of a gatekeeper uh, charged with keeping people out of the studio, so from all roads or roads went through me. Um, but as my career has kind of you know, gone on, I found a real value in uh, you know uh, trusting people and getting uh, you know delegating as much as you can. Um, in the case of, of, of what we our workflow, um, everything starts with me. I think uh, just because I've had a relationship with the studio for so long, I can tell you immediately who's working on what and where it goes. We also have a lot of great internal analytics help or, or tools rather than help kind of telling people, you know, we've got like this wiki and this person, and this is what I'm doing right now. And if you look at my task list, these are all the current deadlines I've worked on. And here's the bottlenecks and all the other people that are waiting on my work. So please don't bother me. Uh, you know, so stuff like that. But uh, basically, Kevin's through, you know, let's say you use Kevin as an example. Um, early on, I would kind of walk them through and introduce people and start those relationships. But Kevin is such a strong researcher. And because he's been on both sides, of the fence. He's been in development, he's been in research, he totally understands the dynamic, and he was able to integrate himself very quickly into the studio culture. Uh, and now we're all just there together. Uh, there's another producer on my team that works with me, and we all just kind of have uh, synergy uh, when we go into this room, and we spend about 25 to 30 weeks um, a year uh, in that lab working on whatever project uh, currently The Last of Us Part Two. So, um, you know, it's really important that the, the, your, your researcher knows who to talk to and that you trust in that individual to be able to have those communications, but there needs to be some transparency as well. Uh, and that's, that's kind of how it works for us. So switching over, um, you guys have worked on a lot of fantastic games, right? So let's, let's talk a little bit about kind of your experience with those individual titles. So, like, as far as, you know, research on the, the games that you guys have worked on, what do you feel has been the most important piece of research or finding that had the biggest impact on your projects? Any anecdotes on that? It's a really interesting question. I've been thinking about this ever since you sent this question over. And um, you know what's interesting is I don't know whether there's ever a single piece of research that has had a prolific effect on what we've done. Um, if we're doing it right, uh, it's not a single piece of research that's uh, an epiphany. It's a gradual building of information over time that's kind of helping inform a development team in terms of what decisions they need to make. And I think there's more value in a process over time than a single, like, oh my god, enemies can see Ellie, holy shit, you know, this is crazy. Uh, there were, well, to an anecdotal, uh, anecdotally to that, there was a moment where I think we were six weeks out from launching The Last of Us, and uh, we still hadn't decided if Ellie was going to be visible to enemies or not. And so we would have one uh, usability test where Ellie would have complete visibility to enemies, and she'd clamor out and blow everybody's stealth, and people would yell and scream for 40 minutes, and then uh, we well, okay, can't do that. And then we we make her invisible, and people are like, what the hell? You're totally removing the immersive of it. How can she run around and bang the drum all day, and nobody's you know, reacting to her? So, uh, you know, having that research, being able to see kind of consumer opinion over time, it was interesting. Um, but I don't think it's a single. I, I have yet to see a single piece of research that's just been the huge light bulb that holy crap, we're doing it wrong. Uh, but that's just. Yeah, I'd say um, so. There was kind of like a cool sort of epiphany moment for me. Like, it, it was the accumulation of a lot of stuff that I had had just thinking about the Civilization franchise, but um, during Civilization VI development, we had this awesome user researcher named Jonathan. He's in the audience somewhere, there he is. Sure. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we had these really great phone calls after each user test that we did. And he was on site a lot, and we, we developed a good relationship. And, uh, you know, we were sort of, we, we did lots of different types of user testing. Sometimes it was people that were new to the Civilization franchise, and we wanted to see, you know, uh, how do they react to playing Civilization VI for the first time? Other times it was like sort of this hardcore audience that we brought back from test to test and they had played, you know, like a thousand hours of Civ Five on Steam accounts and everything. So like we had different kind of demographics we were targeting, but one of the things I noticed with the newer players and sort of came out with these conversations with Jonathan was that 
Okay, short-term objectives, fine. You got this button in the lower right corner, it's like, okay, I need to do this next, I need to do this next, I need to do this next. The longer-term objectives of like, how do I win the game, those were less clear, so that's something that we try to push on. Um, but something that I found that was kind of missing was like, what are the middle-term objectives? Like, what am I doing 50 turns out, 100 turns out? And for me, as, a, as an avid player of Civilization, I know that that's where a lot of the fun is. Like, I develop strategies. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go attack this person, but I wanna get this army first. So I have these sort of mid-range objectives, but there's no system for that. So with Rise and Fall, most recent expansion, I tried to make a system for that, and that's what the ages became, which is these, you know, history divided up into these eight eras. We've got the industrial era, the classical era, and all this stuff. And that was always this sort of just historical trapping and this part of the tech tree, but I wanted to make kind of a mechanic and a system out of it so that players would know, like, okay, well, there's like 40 turns left until the era changes. Maybe I want to do something before that happens. So that kind of came out of these observations and of these conversations. I think one of uh, our biggest findings was when we started uh, collaborating with Oculus on one of the first uh, Oculus VR games, and we had this challenge of creating a moving character and camera, and we didn't want people to get sick. Uh, so that's one of the huge issues with VR is navigation. And so we had to do a battery of tests, and I was very naive at the time. I thought we could do everything like within a month and then get a working camera. Little did I know this would take, you know, we still haven't solved this problem, I think, fully. Uh, but uh, we did. We had to do like tests every single week. We brought in 10 people, and we could see how far they would get through the game before they started to get nauseous or sick. And we really drilled down on what specific camera motions created more nausea than others, or, or disorientation or headaches. And so that was super beneficial. Um, and the other thing that, that was a really key finding, too, was um, how to create horror, which was something that we had never done before, really, as a studio. We made a Resistance series, which was kind of like this dark, dystopian shooter, but uh, we hadn't created like HP Lovecraft-style uh, horror. And so the game wasn't scary, and we did a number of tests, and uh, essentially, I remember um, watching uh, the CEO, Ted Price, of VR on, and we were really hoping he'd get scared. And we we'd slowed the game down, we had all these like, creepy you know, creatures, and then we had our jump scare, and he like, leapt out of the chair. We were like him quietly high-fiving each other <laughs> uh, behind him. So that was a, a really cool uh, moment. So let's talk about, did you guys ever have any like you know, really surprising or really funny moments? I think I just gave mine, actually. So yeah, I guess I guess one of the ones that comes up to mind, and it kind of started, I think, as an accident. But we had these, you know, like these user tests behind one-way mirror and stuff. And like after, like Jonathan would do this debrief conversation where like he'd ask questions and stuff. Um, but then he would kind of leave the room temporarily and come back and like check with us developers. Like, hey, is there any like follow-up questions you want to ask? But we noticed that while it was happening, they started talking to each other, and it's happened like during like food breaks and stuff too. And like being able to like observe the conversations of, like hardcore Civ fans when there's nobody in the room. Like is fascinating because yeah, like intellectually they know okay yeah like we're being recorded all this stuff but like there's something about like that different context that they, they just start kind of shooting the shit with each other a little bit and like those sorts of conversations just to get like a feel for the room and like see kind of like okay well like they clearly care about this thing or you know, that was really valuable and that was really funny to see like we, we kind of like you know felt like we were uh, observing them through like a telescope from far away or something that's kind of cool. I think I have two stories. Brian probably knows one. I'm gonna I'm gonna do an old story and a new story. Uh, and this is just random, but uh, back on Ratchet, way back when we we're at the Sony 99 building. Back in those days, we just had kind of a community focus room, marketing news, uh, company news. Everybody used it, uh, and uh, I think it was midway through the test, and we had a bright idea of serving ten year olds uh, pepperoni pizza and Mountain Dew, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> what this whole did was. Uh, three, three of the poor respondents threw up, and it was all just to see if, anyway, so that was one. No Mountain Dew pizza, like that was done. Uh, and then fast forward a decade or so, and uh, uh, so we're live streaming, we have a picture and pics of uh, the facial camera for the player, uh, and we're all at the stations, we're uh, gearing up, I think this was for Uncharted 4. Uh, we brought in everybody, and this one gentleman had this cap on that said Captain Weed. And that should have been, that should have been, what tipped us off, and it didn't. We're like, okay, you know, it's California, right? Okay. Um, so he sits down and immediately has the Red Bull coffee, and it's it's literally like 10:30, and uh, we're like, what's going on? So okay, we get a coffee, we get a Red Bull, we hype him up, and then he falls asleep playing the game, but we don't notice it because his head's up, and he's just walking into the wall, 
And so I see the chat just go crazy, and everybody's laughing, they're posting videos. And so I, I look around, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's going on. The guy's head's up, everything's good, and then we notice, yeah, the guy's been asleep for about three minutes, just walking in the wall. This is after a Red Bull and a large coffee, so we sent him on his way, but that was just, uh, yeah, recruiting, you know, problem. Kevin knows about that one. Cool. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to the, the audience if they have any questions uh, for the last couple of minutes. But I do have one last question to you guys. So, you know, again, thinking of kind of everything we've discussed or any you know, of the projects we've worked on, um, is there any, you know, approach you're interested in trying or experimenting with? Like anything you're like, oh, I, I, I'd want to see that kind of research conducted on my projects or I've heard about this thing, anything like that? Here's, uh, for us, um, we used a lot of uh, Bill Fulton's kind of uh, early processes. Uh, Kevin brought a lot of that with him, obviously coming from Microsoft Labs. Um, I think we tried some of that. The iterative testing process is interesting to us. I think we do a lot of that already. The one thing that it's more conventional, I think you guys are probably rolling your eyes at this, but um, I would like to find more time to do one-on-one -on -one testing and stream of consciousness uh, exploration because for us, um, that, that kind of data is invaluable, and, and when you try to understand how people are processing systems or puzzles or wayfinding, um, it's really important for us to kind of understand the, the, the process of the thinking and, and kind of what the uh, assessment tools they're utilizing to kind of read the screen, read the UI, understand the tools they have available. Um, it's much more effective for us in a one-on-one -on -one setting, but unfortunately, the amount of tests that we have to do, the amount of data we have to generate, usually forces us to do at least 10-person tests which uh, prohibited a lot of the, the kind of new, uh, intimate testing that we want to do. So I think if we could adopt that, I think it'd be a, a, a real win for us. Yeah, um, even though it's all I've known, I'd imagine that civilization is really hard to do user testing for because it's such a large game. You know, a playthrough can take 10 plus hours. Um, so really boiling that down even into like a three hour session, which is, you know, uh, still very long. You don't get through everything. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm kind of envious of games that are more modular, like you test this level, test this part of this level. Um, but I think where Civilization could do something like that is we are a very systems-based game. And uh, the systems overlap a lot, but I think it'd be useful to do, yeah, like a sort of stream of consciousness, I think like contextual interview sort of thing. Like watch somebody's face, mouse, and <clears throat> thoughts as they like interact with the system for the first time. Like the first time they, uh, in the new Rise and Fall expansion, get a governor point and open up the governor screen. What happens? Does it make sense? Where are they clicking? Where are they looking confused? What are, what are the thoughts coming out of their out of their mind? Like, does this happen with everybody? Is it just this person because it's similar to some other game that they played that they expected would work some other way? So I feel like that stuff would be very useful. Yeah, with like a UI focus. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about doing more individual testing. It certainly helped us out a lot, but it gets tricky with the um, long. Uh, forum play sessions um, and I've been kind of thinking I'm sure this probably already exists and I'd love to talk to you if you've worked on this but um, where someone could sit in a room play through the game and talk as they play and then it will actually log it would be like a I guess a speech to text type thing where it would actually log when they're saying something at key points and if they're just if they just go uh or make a short you know sound it won't log that and then we could actually go back to those clips and of course, you have to find people who are somewhat talkative as they play, but they don't talk too much. Um, but I'm kind of curious about that approach, as well as um, it sounds like I also need to talk to the Naughty Dog folks about just analytics and how we can both use analytics during our tests real time um, to make sure that, you know, um, so we can match things up. Um, we have to kind of take the long route if we see something like a weird death in our telemetry. Uh, we actually don't have to find that time code, and it's a bit of a process, so I want to speed that stuff up. Thank you. So questions? Um, if anyone has uh, any questions for anyone up here, uh, feel free. There's a microphone right in the middle of the stage. Uh, i got about five, ten minutes for you guys want. Thanks, James. I'm always there questions. Um, so you guys are talking about very quick iterative reporting, um, much smaller than I'm used to. So I'm curious, um, what kind of scope are you guys looking for in those kind of tests? Like if you're getting a turnaround of a couple hours, how much are you testing in that time span? So uh, we're typically testing 15 minutes worth of content. So that might be one short uh, mission, and um, I'll have four people go through it in roughly an hour to an hour and a half, just like back to back, just bring them in the room. And if they don't finish the mission, that's it, they're out, and we just move on. Uh, and then 
that's usually it. We don't try to go past 30 minutes for our internal um, tests. Ours are a bit longer, and the reports take more time to prepare, um, though sometimes the stuff we see ourselves will act on immediately. Um, but we do, um, usually I think the format has been like two days. Each day is like a three hour play session and like a 45 minute discussion at the end. So they're, you know, like it's a two work day sort of thing for us. And it's again, like getting through like a 200 turns or so of CIV with four different test groups. So this may freak some people out in here, uh, but it's usually a minimum for us, seven hours of gameplay up to about 25. Uh, so we usually split that over three to five days of testing. We're running about six hours a day. Uh, but at the end of those days, uh, you don't just wrap up, right? You have that real small window to action that item, all that info that we have, all the different data points very quickly. Uh, so generally, we break the game up. Uh, we'll work with QA team to meaningfully chunk out the, the game in terms of where we want people to start to stop each day. And uh, it usually works out to be about uh, five to seven hours of actual content. Hey guys, thanks for coming out and giving this talk. This is really awesome. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell us about any times when things went wrong with research, where you had some sort of avo potentially avoidable error or something that uh, pitfalls that you could help share about that help other people avoid making the same mistakes. That's a very interesting question. Uh, I think things go wrong all the time. Uh, I mean, it's never an exact science, right? There's never. I, even uh, our unicorn peaker doesn't have a perfect track record. Um, but I think that the idea here is to develop a synergy with your development team so that it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to uh, propose, uh, conceptualize what a problem might be, right? Um, what's great is that you use the data, you use the tools around you, come up with a logical uh, you know, conclusion, and if, it's, if it smokes out, that's great, and if it doesn't, that's great too. I think nobody is looking for the silver bullet every time. Uh, nobody's critical of that. Uh, it's, it's just about engaging, uh, to your point, knowing the game, understanding the systems underneath the game, uh, and being a, you know, a meaningful participant in the development process. And then making mistakes is, is part of uh, who we are. Yeah, mistakes definitely unavoidable. Um, I find that like, our, our, um, our play testers have like a sort of, I think of it almost like as a bandwidth of feedback. Uh, there's deeper stuff that might be more meaningful, but if there's superficial stuff, like that might get in the way of them thinking about it. So like one of the kind of embarrassing ones for us was we had um, in Rise and Fall, there's this, uh, when you're, there's, there's this part of the UI that says like, oh, like the next Civic that you unlock will give you a governor point. Um, but that was sort of duplicating over and over, and it would eventually run off the end of the screen, even if you wouldn't actually get a governor point. So it's just confusing on so many levels. Um, and you know that obviously came up in a lot of the feedback. And we're like, and that was one of the moments where we were behind one. We were like tearing our hair out. Like we fixed it in code three hours ago, but they don't have that bill and like all that sort of stuff. So, so yeah, like mistakes are going to be unavoidable. But you know, um, that's where like a, a good moderator and like an iterative build process, where like maybe the next day of the two-day thing, you can get an updated build of that thing. Um, that's where that sort of stuff can come in handy. Yeah, the uh, biggest issue I run into, which is kind of silly, is I actually am one person at Insomniac. I just recently hired uh, someone else, so for the longest time I was a team of, of one. Uh, and I was also working on multiple projects. So that's why we would do these short 10 minute tests across either a VR project, or Spider Man, or something else. Uh, but it was tech setup. That was the thing that would screw me up, is I just wouldn't get all of the uh, updates in time. Um, play through it in the, for 10 minutes because I just didn't have time. And we would run into situations where People would be sh show up, I'd be streaming, and it wouldn't work. Uh, so that was the thing that I just have to drill uh, into my own head and to my uh, researchers. We just need to be prepared way in advance. For QA. Yeah, I know. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, you had all mentioned when, you know, it's like, what do you think of games research? It was like anxiety, fear, and like, you know, stuff like that. Um, and you mentioned later that building trust and having a researcher that you trust to present that information is something that's really important for all of you. And can you talk to me a little bit about what trust means for you or what building trust looks like in that kind of a relationship? Absolutely, that's a great question. Uh, I think um, for us it meant bringing the researcher into the studio and just um, having beers, uh, going out to dinner afterwards, just getting to know um, the researchers and on a first name basis so that when later they were delivering a report, you know, this was someone we hung out with, this is a, a fellow colleague, it's not just some stranger in an ivory tower <laughs> delivering us this, um, this report. 
So you know, certainly over time, as we've um, worked um, certainly with Sony, uh, working with the same publisher um, for years, we've gotten to know everyone there, and um, they're like uh, team members rather than uh, someone handing out a mandate. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, it's definitely, yeah, it's, it's, it's a valuable thing to hang out with people and get the face, get the face time. Um, I would say too, like, um, especially with a game like Civilization, like it's, it's a complicated game, um, you know, it takes a while to get into, and if you're a user researcher, kind of like trying a lot of different types of genres and stuff, it might not be the easiest thing to like conceptualize, okay, well, how do I test this game? How do I play this game? But one of the things I really appreciate is when, you know, the user researcher digs down and plays the game themselves and like gets an understanding of like, okay, well, here's my experiences, but here's what I get confused. And um, that gives them a nice context for everything else that comes after. Um, and it also like like one of the things I appreciated with Jonathan was like he would play the same build that the that the playtesters were going to play. So and he would kind of go in blind. Like he was aware of our design goals, but he wouldn't like if there's a system he didn't understand, he didn't look at documentation. He would just note that he didn't understand that, and he would try to see if he could draw that out from other player, players in discussion as well. So that sort of like uh, transparency and uh, respect for the goals that the studio is trying to do, I think, were really important. I don't know how to follow that. That was a great answer. Uh, uh, you know, what's, what's interesting for me, when Kevin first started at Sony, um, we had actually met for the first time at GDC a few years ago, I don't know how many years ago, it's all blur now, we are at a dinner, and Kevin's sitting next to me, and like, so, you know, I'm very cynical, you know, uh, so what are you here for, what do you want to do? And he's like, well, I want to work with Naughty Dog. I'm like, oh, really? Uh, that's interesting. Uh, and, and the, but, you know, he demonstrated, you know, he played all the games, he uh, had an understanding of the products, uh, he was very passionate, and he really knew what he was doing, and it made it really easy. And to Brian's point, you know, beers, socialization, spending time in the studio. I mean, Brian is in the studio, or, or Kevin and Brian, my colleague, are in the studio. Uh, oftentimes, we're there for <clears throat> weeks at a time. So we're all going through this together. And uh, we, the more time you spend with uh, your researcher, the more you can trust their vision, and the more you're in sync with one another, that synergy is important, uh, but it's only built over time. It's not going to happen overnight, and you have to treat it like any other relationship uh, for it to grow. All right, last question. So thank you for sharing your insights and uh, experience. And I wanted to shift gears a little bit. Uh, you guys talk about uh, your expectations and the way that you work with specific studies, uh, the timeliness, the reports, and so on. But I would like to hear what's your approach or your thoughts about thinking about user experience research as a long-term component of the game development. So moving from a view of a study, study to that process, how do you see UX research as part of that long-term iterative design process? Well, for us, uh... <clears throat> It's integrated from the beginning. Um, so we don't, there's no segregation here. Um, design will let us know when they want us to prototype uh, a system or a behavior. Just recently, uh, we worked with Maria Chappelle, uh, our new uh, UI designer at Naughty Dog, and she had a very specific set of UI that she wanted tested. Uh, we built out a test plan that worked for her that was enabling her to get the information she needed. But working with everybody early on, um, integrating all of the different design goals. Uh, research is, is not something that's bespoke ever. Um, it's part of the development process. It's built into our schedule, it's built into our testing schedule. Design utilizes uh, research and, and research cycles for all the different systems they develop. Um, there's, it's not two different groups working separately. It's, it's all symbiosis. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. I think um, the long-term goal is sort of a cultural shift in development itself and in design like as a designer like I yeah like I have started to think more about like okay well when I design a screen or a system like I'm, I'm projecting in my head forward like how is this going to be in the user research test like what are people going to run into what are the lessons I've learned in the past so yeah like it shouldn't be these bolted on like modular like okay like do a test and like get some feedback and do that and then like move on to the next test it should be kind of woven in with the building process itself and yeah i don't think every studio and every publisher is there yet um i certainly think Fraxis could go a little further but you know the parts that we have done so far are already so valuable so my background is in design mainly and i, I was a student of the mark cerny uh, method and was very much into creating a macro design very early on tried to 
suss out and work out all of the problems at a very early stage. Uh, and so I feel like now I can kind of look at a project from two different angles, um, both from the user research side, which typically happens later in production, but I want to try to use uh, some of those strengths um, for working and looking at early design plans and potentially looking at either like animatics or storyboards, uh, even at a very early stage and asking um, our potential audience what they would think of it and get some valuable feedback there. So I, I would like to be able to weave uh, user research throughout the entire uh, pre-production and production stages of the project. Thank you guys, appreciate you guys coming in and giving your insights.